Welcome to this week's session. Uh, this week we're going to look into uh, Weaverbird tools in Grasshopper. Uh, Weaverbird, uh, as you may know, is a mesh modeling plugin for Grasshopper. And um, I normally use Weaverbird for smoothing geometries. So I'm going to show you a quick example of uh, the overall uh, Weaverbird workflow first. Then we're going to look into some applications and I've already prepared some example here. Uh, which basically um, develops some uh, nice continuous geometry that could be uh, used as uh, maybe floor uh, slabs of a tower. So we're going to look into how to model something like this. And uh, we're also going to uh, learn uh, some more about meshes. So um, I'm going to show you the module that I've prepared here, which is uh, a mesh geometry. So um, you can actually produce something like this uh, really easy. Uh, you can just go to, um, let's say, your top view. And the one that I've used was here. I'm going to actually delete this one and show you how you can model one on your own. You can turn on your grid snap. Uh, then basically, we could uh, actually go to mesh tools and mesh creation. And you can start modeling a mesh using the grid. Uh, the reason why I'm uh, snapping to the grid is because um, later on we would like these meshes or these quads. Uh, in this case, I'm working with uh, four-sided uh, meshes. Uh, we want these meshes to join with each other. So that's why snapping them uh, using a grid is essential. Now let's say that I have uh, these four modules and then I want to combine them somehow. So I can just copy these and turn the points on and move these points around here. Then I'm going to mirror these two. And I can create a geometry like this. I can also make it uh, mirrored uh, like such. And this is the uh, mesh geometry that I've just created. Now, what Reverbert does is it joins this and it smooths this out. So um, you can actually use this as kind of a, a guiding geometry for later topological uh, modeling. So I'm going to show you the overall workflow. You can uh, double click and input these as mesh. So right click and set multiple meshes and I'm going to input these flat meshes, flat quads that I have uh, produced. Now when you look at the information, you can see that they have four vertices each and they have only one face. And what we want to do is go to uh, the viewer tool and um, what you want to do is under extract, you want to do join meshes, meshes and weld. And what this does is it will turn this into a single mesh. Now, if I look at the information, you will see that we have a total vertex count of 48 and total face count is 12. So the faces are basically these faces, these surfaces. And uh, vertex count is the amount of uh, points that are used to define the mesh geometry. So, um, what we can do is do a bunch of smoothing and those smoothing options are under subdivision. So you can try Catmull Clark subdivision and there, there are previews of how these subdivisions are made. Normally I resort to loop subdivision. You can also try other ones. Um, all you have to do is um, connect this geometry to the mesh and then under the number of uh, subdivisions you can make it up to, um, I normally do up to three. But we're going to do this in a few steps. So when you do one, uh, you can, I'm actually going to bake the output so that we can see what's happening. So this is what happens after we subdivide it by once. So you can see that every quad is subdivided into uh, triangles and further uh, segments, right? So this is actually kind of like a smoothing operation for this topology. And if I do it once more, then you can see that we will have more triangles added and the geometry would be uh, smoothed even further, right? So this is the second level subdivision. And if I do a third uh, level subdivision, of course, the number of triangles are increasing because the geometry is being smoothed out as well, right? So this is the third level. The second and third level, um, let's see, I, I actually forgot to make it three. Let's do this again. So we could do three and this is the third level subdivision. You can see that the geometry is uh, a lot smoother, but there are also a lot more uh, meshes in it. 
because the, this is mesh geometry, it's it's actually easier to store this uh, and work with these sorts of um, um, geometries. And um, uh, basically, um, it th this input controls kind of the topological uh, volume or surface that we want to model. And when we use Weaverbird, we can actually smooth that out. Um, now, there are also a lot of different uh, advantages to this. For instance, what we could do is if this were to be a module, then we can technically populate this and make it wider. And if I were to now, let's say, use this as a surfacing uh, tool, then if I input all of them together after the join, uh, these would be actually these could become a singular surface, right? So that's kind of the advantage with Weaverbird. So they, it could actually connect uh, segmented uh, or modular mesh geometries together, and it could give you a continuous smoothed out topology. And uh, that's actually the essence of the workshop for today. So we are going to work with a module that I've prepared already, which is here. So I have prepared um, kind of a nice. Um, three-dimensional uh, module and what I want to do is make this in such a way that when this is stacked on top of each other so when we uh, actually populate this vertically like such uh, you can see that these elements are going to join right so the module uh, needs to be strategically designed in such a way that when we um, make a vertical array then the geometries are joined and if I were to put these in, you can see after the third subdivision, um, we actually get kind of a nice uh, smoothed out surface. So this is this is kind of the effect that I got. You can actually make um, this parametrically if you start with a box and then you define the meshes inside that geometry. You can make it parametrically, but uh, for this exercise, I'm actually going to use box morph, which I covered in an earlier tutorial. And uh, you can just design this kind of uh, mesh topology, and then we're going to use it to populate uh, on twisting uh, twisting boxes. So I'll show you kind of a nice way of modeling twisting boxes as well. So um, so that we can actually control uh, the topological variation uh, of this mapping. So let's begin. I'm going to actually uh, delete these uh, tests that I've made so that we can start from scratch. This is going to be the whole tutorial. Uh, but let's start with uh, creating a new sketch. And this is the mesh volume that we want to produce. And I need, um, I actually need two surfaces, two sets of surfaces. So I can um, just define two offset surfaces and I can extrude these two and we can explode them. So this is surface one, this is surface two. Um, I actually did this in a different way. I actually did it using planes. That That's actually a lot easier. So maybe we can actually start with that. Let's actually start with um, planes and surfaces. So you just create a vertical array using series and a bunch of um, numbers. So we can do total number count two and let's say we want um, them to be spaced out by three and I want to create a point so these are going to be um, their XYZ and um, I want to place a plane at each point now using these uh, we can actually do um, we can actually produce boxes right so I'm going to first show you how we can make an array then we're going to make uh, some topological uh, variations to this. So um, we can actually produce boxes on these uh, by saying, um, let's look at box, there is a center box, there is a domain box. Um, we can actually start with center box. So let's say I have boxes here and then I want their X dimension to be, let's say by 10. Uh, let's make actually this five or four, then the other direction we want it, let's say by 10 and the Z, we want it to be, I think six. Um, is six enough? Actually, they should be, um, let's see. They should be actually two is too much because we have three, so let's make this four. So they stack nicely on top of each other. 
So um, the idea with box morph is pretty straightforward. What we have is a geometry that we want to populate and this, these are going to be the target boxes. So I'm going to create a mesh for the input, set multiple meshes. Then I can do a bounding box and we want this to be a union box so that we have a singular box to map. Then we do a box morph and this is the target box. This is the geometry that I want to um, morph and this is my reference geometry. And um, let's see if I hide these. The geometry is not properly um, um, properly um, distributed, properly morphed, morphed because uh, this is made out of multiple meshes. So if you look at here, this has 20 different elements, whereas the boxes there are, they, I also have 20, so they are one-to-one -one mapped. But what we want to do is map all the meshes to all the boxes. So for that reason, we need to right-click here to geometry and graph this so that all these elements could be mapped onto, um, onto the geometry. Right, so this will be the result. And what's happening is uh, basically this reference geometry is contained inside a box and we have target boxes as well, target geometries. So each of these vertices has a reference within that box and that's used to topologically distort that geometry to map it onto the target box. And there are some advantages to use this for uh, more dynamic applications which we will get into. But this will be essentially the workflow. So I can parametrically control the vertical amount of uh, boxes. And after we morph it, all I have to do is um, use Weaver Bird's join meshes and weld. So you want to flatten these meshes again. And then you can do loop subdivision all the way up to two or three levels and bake this. And that will give you kind of the nice um, topological continuity between these elements. But I had a different exercise in mind. So what if we want to, uh, let's say, not do this kind of linear, um, linear population. We want to actually maybe topologically control um, the, um, the ratio of this element, right? So how can we actually do something like that? So we're we going to work on, uh, work on that this week. Um, so to do that, we can, um, so what I want to do is control how this is mapped onto the, um, the boxes. And we can actually do something like this. So imagine uh, we have a mirrored version of this like that, or actually I think it was the other way. So I think we have a mirrored version like that. And we have two target boxes to map this uh, map this to, and we can control the middle division using some uh, parametric continuity. So let's uh, let's do something like that. So uh, one way of approaching this problem uh, would be because the boxes would be distorted, we need to be able to model twisting boxes onto the geometry, and twisting boxes take um, eight different points to be mapped. So I'm going to do this uh, only once to actually make sure that we are doing the mapping correctly. And then we're going to um, make the vertical array uh, a lot more dynamic. So first thing is we need to construct a, a, a box that, that can twist so that this mapping could work properly. So for the twisting box, uh, we have the planes, but we need some points. So uh, we can actually start with uh, point oriented and using uh, these planes, I can actually specify some points on this plane. So let's say we get a point at zero, zero, and let's say we do, actually, I'm going to also enter some dimensions here. So let's say this is the zero, zero point. And then I'm going to do, um, move it around here. So let's make it five in the U direction. So that will be the edge of the uh, box. A third point, and this will have the same width, uh, but the length would be different. So we're going to move, let's say 15 units this way. And the last guy would have uh, zero as its U input. And V input would be 
let's say um, it's going to be 15 again, but the view input would be zero. So that's correct. And I want to do this by only once. So let's go all the way up to two. So uh, we're going to just make one box and make sure that that twisting box is actually working. So we're going to do this once and we have these uh, points and you can see that uh, we are doing this per level, right? So we have um, two points stacked on top of each other. So for twisting box, um, uh, twisted box, what I need to do is find out these, um, these eight corner points. And the way to start would be from this, um, this point here from the top uh, closest point to us and go in the clockwise fashion. So I need to start with uh, these points and then go in the clockwise fashion. So I need to do the top face first and then the bottom face. So um, if you look at the information of the number of points, we have two points, but when we increase the point count, you can see that this the list is increasing. So uh, we need to do some shifting around here so that we can actually find the right points uh, to put. So if I do shift list and we can turn its wrapping off and I'm going to either shift in a negative direction or in the positive direc direction so I can do an interval of minus one to one. So for to get the top point, I can shift this list by one so I get the top point and um, this is actually the same operation that we're going to do to all of these lists. So I'm going to make copies of this and attach all the other points and we can start constructing our twisting box. So the first point would be A, then I'll go to B, uh, the, the, the behind point and then go here going in a clockwise fashion and then here. So this is this has been the ordering so that you can see it actually goes in this way. And then um, what we can do is make another copy of these and uh, now move to the points below. So I'm going to move into the minus, uh, minus one shifted list and find the bottom point on the closest one to us. This would be E and go again in the bottom face clockwise fashion. This is G, this is H and that's my twisting box. Now the advantage to this would be, uh, I'm actually going to show you why I'm building this box using um, eight corner points. Uh, it might look a bit tedious, but this will enable us to topologically control this box. So it's, imagine moving one of these vertices, right? So if this box is a bit distorted, then let's look at the mapping. So if this were my target, you can see how that target uh, mapping is affected, right? So having some control over the topology of this box, we can actually control how we want to do our mapping. So um, this is uh, this is actually one half of the um, of the problem. The other half is um, uh, basically mapping this uh, mirrored. And what I want to do is do this operation twice. So um, I need a third evaluation point in the middle so that we can actually bake uh, this guy to half of the uh, half of the row and the other one to the, to the other row so that we can uh, have a vertical stack and this connection we can actually control uh, topologically. We can we can vary how we want this mapping uh, mapping to take effect. So I'm going to move this around a bit and let's see. Um, we have this box kind of uh, done and I want another box here but I need um, I need other points here so I need new points in the middle so those points uh, we can actually produce one more right so I can make a copy here for the UNV and this guy we can actually move it uh, somewhere in the middle so let's make it around seven and the U could be the same so that uh, it sits at zero and then I want another one um, that has this U value, which is five. So that's that's the second point. Okay. And um, if you remember, um, now we have to do two twisting boxes. So this these connections wouldn't work. So I need rather than going to these guys, I need to go to these guys, right? So I I know this is going to get a bit more 
um, confusing or maybe cluttered. But basically what you need to do is define a twisting box on the left side and another one on the right side of it. So let's copy these shifts and bring these guys in as well. And what I want to do is replace these two points. This point needs to be replaced with this guy. This point needs to be replaced with this guy. And you can also check what's happening with your uh, twisting box too. So this is at the right place. And I just, uh, I'm going to use these for the second, uh, second twisting box. Um, for the other half, we can make copies of these two and bring in these guys again. So this is in the uh, this is the bottom points, and let's find out which ones we need to replace. So we need to replace these two with these two. So this guy would be replaced with this one. So let's see that goes to H, and this would be my new H, and this guy would be the next G. So now I have placed the twisting box on half of the uh, half of the module. Now let's do the other twisting box too. So I'm going to make a copy of this one. And we're going to start with this point in the middle. So uh, let's see, let's find that point. So that would be here. And I think it is one of these. This guy is the first point. I'm going to start with this one. Actually, let's disconnect these so that we don't get confused. We can actually write a new T box. So we start with this guy, go to, uh, actually we need to stay on top. So we go here and then go to the ones that I've disconnected, which were below here. So we go here and then we go here. So that's the tap, uh, top portion. Then for the bottom portion, I need to find this one. Then we go behind it and then we need to plug in these two. This one and this one, and that will be the second twisting box. Now, um, what we need to do is um, I actually uh, bake this. I need to bake it to this guy instead. So this geometry, the way it is, it needs to be baked um, to this target box. And for this one, we need this to be baked in a mirrored fashion. So you don't have to change the mesh um, or the morphing operation, what we need to do is first take a mirror of this, mirror geometry, mirror an object. We want to mirror this and we want to use, let's find the plane. We need to use the XZ plane to mirror this. So that guy's uh, other version is here and we can make another bounding box for that. And we can do another box more for that. So this will be my um, target box. This would be its reference geometry and this would be the mirrored version is the geometry itself. So you can see now we have actually doubled um, the geometries. And I can hold shift and plug this in there too. And you can see now this is one geometry being baked. So if I bake it, um, Sometimes the joining doesn't work, uh, especially below when it's at zero. I, I noticed this actually. If, if I move the starting point slightly up, let's say we started from one, uh, the geometry actually tends to work uh, when we join it. So that's kind of a small technical glitch, um, but it tends to fix the issue, just move it above uh, zero. And you can see the this is actually the connected combined geometry. Now, uh, of course, we have some customization to do, especially for these midpoints. Um, I, I'm planning to parameterize these two points here. Um, but what we could also do um, uh, is uh, essentially look at the array, right? So if I increase these point counts, you can see that our um, tower is nicely stacking up. And we can also change the uh, the step size so that we can control the floor height or how much spacing we want among these. Um, I can also control topologically how I want to vary these points. You can see we can actually get some nice proportional relationship or distortion 
between these two uh, modules. So I'm going to just bake one instance for you so that you could see. So this is one of the instances. Um, but what I want to do instead is um, make this different. So make make this kind of parametric. I want to make it very more variable. And uh, because we are going from zero to some number here, you can see we're going from zero to some number. I can actually plug in a graph mapper here quickly and test uh, how this is going to work. So we can actually do a range. And for this range, we have eight levels. So we can actually subtract one from this value because range always produces one more value. And I can bring this in here. And let's just put a Bezier graph type. And this could be used as a percentage. You can also customize the vertical dimension. But I also have a component here. So I can simply multiply this with my coefficient and plug it to V. You can see now I'm actually controlling where these points are evaluated, right? So I can actually make it a bit more dynamic and variable. I'm going to do the same to the second graph below it. So we can plug this in and this guy goes to this parameter. And I can actually make this a lot more complex. Uh, you can uh, you can also change this guy a bit so that they distort. So let's move this um, maybe around here. So now they're they're quite twisting, right? So maybe um, if you want to get the right effect, uh, another idea is to actually increase. Um, these portions, these slab portions here. So what you can do is simply scale this up. Let's say rather than one, make it three. And that will automatically update um, how that geometry is going to be baked, right? Because it, we are increasing the, um, the slab ratio. You can also increase this part. Let's make that three as well. So you can see I'm diminishing the ratio of these elements. And let's see what else we could do. We can actually make this uh, one side a lot smoother. Maybe make this into a linear graph on this side. And the other side is maybe dynamically shifting like that, right? So if I um, increase the slab count, my vertical displacement is also changing. And when I do a loop subdivision, you can also see the, um, the topological distortions are actually uh, working quite nicely, right? So that's, that's the um, effect or the power of the, um, of the box morph. Uh, so let's see, I'm actually going to delete these so that we can actually see a bit this movement better. And I'm going to keep this part, but I'm going to make this a bit smaller so that you can see that um, we can see this motion a bit more. So there you go. That's kind of the um, variation. So the, those surfaces are actually flowing into one another. They're continuous because that's how we designed our mesh. Um, now to top this off, you can actually use some of the transform tools with Weaverbird. There's something called Mesh Thicken. You can actually get this and just thicken the mesh a bit. You can also do some smoothing. So you can do Laplacian smoothing or blur, um, Laplacian HC smoothing uh, or blurring. Uh, calculates a smoothened um, representation of an original mesh, but it only in respect to colors and vertex coordinated. So we can try some of these to see um, how the smoothing would work. So this also subdivides it further, but uh, you also need to define what you want to do with naked edges. Now, for this um, for this execution, all, all of these edges are naked because they're not connected. Uh, so you can keep them as they are. So they could be fixed or they could be further smoothed out, right? So, and that would be um, that would be the choice to go. And let's actually give this a white material. 
this one too. So you can see these are the two variations that I've uh, developed for this tutorial. And you can see this is kind of moving nicely. And the only way to achieve something like this would be to use a meshed component, um, combine it with Weaver Bird tools. And also you need to build twisting boxes so that you can control the topology uh, as a continuous um, distortion. Um, I hope you like this tutorial um, and um, I try to upload videos every week to this channel. So if you're interested in um, seeing more of this material, please consider subscribing. And uh, if you have any questions, you can leave comments below um, or you can also email me uh, to this channel. And um, I'll see you guys uh, next week with another session. Take care.